Hi, we've been talking about utilitarianism and more broadly about consequentialist approaches to ethics, approaches that take consequences as fundamental to understanding what moral action is. Today I want to talk about problem cases, cases that present at least prima facie difficulties for consequentialist approaches. They vary in their nature, but they all have the characteristic of suggesting that if we focus solely on consequences, we might be making a moral mistake. Now, some philosophers think that consequences are ultimately unimportant in ethics, but more think they matter, but they're not the only thing that matters. And most of these cases are designed to probe our intuitions about that, to say, is it really the case that consequences are all that matters? So we might construct cases like this that are really specifically about utilitarianism, having to do with pleasure and pain, having to do specifically with utilitarian ways of understanding happiness. But we could think about the good more broadly, and many of these would apply to really any consequentialist theory, not specifically a hedonistic utilitarian one of the kind that Bentham and Mill actually propose. Let's take a look at some of these cases. There are five I'm going to talk about today. There are certainly more that philosophers have mentioned, but these are the five I want to focus on. I call them Fort Sensible, the Accidental Tourist, the Gladiators, the Healthy Patient, and finally, the Trolley Problem. Let's talk first about Fort Sensible. What is Fort Sensible? Well, here's the idea. You've got a fort out on the frontier somewhere, and the forces that you're protecting your society against manage to capture one of your soldiers. And they accuse him of some crime. You know he's innocent of the crime. He couldn't possibly have done it. But they are going to torture him to death unless you surrender the fort. What do you do? Well, you might be thinking, okay, look, if I surrender the fort, I am really violating my own principles of command. But, uh, and who knows what they're going to do. But on the other hand, if I don't surrender the fort, and they promise they'll leave us alone if I do surrender the fort, that we'll be able to escape safely. However, if I do, if I don't, then an innocent man is going to be tortured to death. That's terrible. And so it looks like I face the choice between saving my fort and my men or sacrificing an innocent person to a horrible death for a crime he did not commit. What should I do? Well, the objection goes, the utilitarian says, in effect, the ends justify the means. And so even if an innocent person faces a horrible death, I should let that happen to save the rest of the people. Is that really what a utilitarian has to say? And is it the right answer? I mean, one way to go here is to say, well, that is the right answer. You should sacrifice one life to save more. But another possibility is to say, well, no, you shouldn't. And so there's something wrong with the consequentialist approach. In this case, the killing of an innocent person is an evil you ought to avoid, no matter what the consequences of trying to avoid it are. But the utilitarian, of course, doesn't have to say, I think we should let him die and save the rest of the fort. After all, you've got to think about the long-term consequences of this. A lot of countries have the policy that you should never negotiate with terrorists. Why? Well, not because in the short term, it wouldn't be to your advantage to do it. It might well be to your advantage to do it. But what happens in the long term? Negotiate this time with terrorists, and the next time, the, the terrorists are encouraged to make further demands and threaten even greater harm if you don't give in. And so in this case, okay, so let's say you decide to surrender the fort. You manage to withdraw, but at least your men are safe. Well, first of all, what's the guarantee that they're going to allow you to escape? Maybe as you leave the fort, they're going to slaughter you all. You're not sure about that, so judging the consequences is hard. Remember, you have to think about all the probabilities and think about the outcome on all of those. So it's not clear that the calculation is come out, going to come out in favor of allowing the innocent man to die. But also, when you think about the long-term effects, you can say, well, wait a minute. Now they can go around to every fort in the territory and make similar demands. And are we always going to give in? At some point, surely we're going to have to fight, or else they just take this entire territory. So it doesn't seem to me that obvious in such a case exactly what consequentialism predicts. And it might also not be that obvious what, in a particular case, is really the right answer. Let's move on to the next example, the accidental tourist. This is a case brought as an objection against utilitarianism by Bernard Williams. And here's the idea. 
you're a tourist, you're just going through a foreign country, not very familiar with it, but you walk into a town square and you see a bunch of pro-democracy activists lined up against a wall and about to be shot. Let's say there are 20 of them. And the captain who is about to give the command to the firing squad sees you come in and says, ah, I see you are upset by what we are about to do. Um, these men have committed no crime, but they are opposing a ruling junta. They must die. And you have a shocked face, expression on your face. So he says, but I will make you a deal. Come here. If you shoot one of them yourself, I will let the other 19 go free. What do you do? 20 people, 20 innocent people are about to be shot. You could save 19 of them, but you've got to actually kill the one. Are you willing to do it? Again, the Williams argument is, it looks like the utilitarian has to say, yes, I'll do it. Saving the 19 by killing the one. But he thinks that's plainly the wrong answer. It's wrong to shoot an innocent person. You can't do that. And so he finds that morally objectionable and uses that as an argument, a reason for rejecting consequentialist approaches. Again, in that situation, I'm not sure it's that obvious what you ought to do. Presumably, the people they're about to be shot are saying, yes, do it, do it, do it. We're going to die anyway. 19 of us might be saved, so please do it. Their relatives gathered around, their loved ones are saying, yes, do it, do it. So should you? Well, maybe it's not always so clear. However, let's assume Williams is right that you shouldn't do it. Does the utilitarian so clearly predict that you should? Hard to say. After all, what's to prevent the captain, once you've shot one, from saying, I'm sorry, but I'm changing the deal. There are now 19. Shoot one more and I'll let the other 18 go free. And so you might think, yeah, look, um, it's not obvious to me that I can trust this man. He's about to shoot a bunch of innocent people, after all. Can I trust his word? Um, similarly, with the terrorists and so on, you might say, look, these people are willing to do horrible things. Why should I trust them in this context? But there's another problem as well. Uh, what about the future? What about the long-term effects? After all, it might be that because you're there as a witness, after this slaughter, Newspapers all over the world report, you know, slaughter of innocents in this village. However, if you do it, the headlines are going to say, crazed tourist shoots man. <laughs> and so it might be that actually that's much worse for the pro-democracy forces. It might well be that the best thing is to have these people slaughtered and then have the international pressure build and maybe a revolution deposes the ruling junta and so forth. And so, what really are the effects of your action? Princess Elizabeth, in writing to Descartes at one point, raises an objection against an idea of Descartes that's a little bit like consequentialism. And she says, how can you predict the future? How do you know what the long-term effects are? It looks like this kind of theory requires an infinite knowledge. Now, you can take that as an objection against consequentialism, which is how she meant it. But you could also say it means in cases like this, in Fort Sensible, in the accidental tourist case, it isn't entirely clear how that utilitarian calculation ought to come out. The short term, yes, it looks as if, in the short term, you ought to shoot the innocent person. You ought to allow the innocent man to die. But in other cases, you might think, wait, what? well, and even here, once we start thinking about the long-term effects, you think it's not so clear anymore. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but is it obvious? that the long-term as well as the short-term effects favor my doing this action that otherwise seems really terribly immoral. And I don't think it's always so clear. So it's not obvious what the consequentialist has to say in some of these cases. Here's perhaps an even more disturbing case, the gladiators. Irving Kristol mentioned this case quite a long time ago. He says, it looks like putting gladiators into a ring to fight to the death is a terrible thing. Happened in ancient Rome. Sometimes they fought each other. Sometimes they slaughtered animals. Sometimes they slaughtered Christians or other people viewed as undesirable enemies of the empire. But in any event, we now look at that and think this sort of gladi gladiatorial combat is a terrible, terrible thing. However, Crystal's point is, wait, on a consequentialist perspective, if enough people gain enough enjoyment from watching this, 
then it's actually morally justified. Maybe, in fact, it's a morally good thing. All we have to do is imagine that there are enough people in the stands. And you say, but wait, these people are fighting for their lives. One of them is going to be slaughtered. That's really, really bad. And of course, there might be many of these contests going on in one afternoon at the stadium. So all of this would seem to be a terrible thing. But look, imagine that it's a really big coliseum. And if you think, well, I don't see how the pleasure of even 100,000 people could balance the pain and suffering of the gladiators, then imagine that there's a huge television audience of millions <laughs> or even billions. Surely the consequentialist has to say that at some point it adds up to enough to balance the pain and suffering of the gladiators. But he says that seems wrong. It looks as if no amount of pleasure that the uh, spectators might gain can really justify such a spectacle. Well, we can ask, let's grant that Crystal is right, that gladiatorial combat seems like a terrible thing, no matter how many people are around watching it and enjoying it. But does the consequentialist have to approve of it in those circumstances? You might think that a society that is going to enjoy and take pleasure in this kind of combat is a society that is going to become insensitive in a variety of other ways. So if we think about long-term consequences, we might say, look, if this were a one-time deal, that once this happened, well, okay, maybe we would come to that conclusion. But this wasn't a one-time thing in ancient Rome. It was a common practice, and it continued for quite a long time. It's the sort of thing that you might think made people insensitive to all sorts of other injustices, all sorts of other crimes and examples of cruelty. And so certain things can have the long-term effect, maybe even not that long-term effect, of really coarsening a culture, of harming people in that kind of way. And so we need to think about this not in terms of the immediate pleasure of whatever spectators are enjoying this scene. We have to think also about the long-term effects. What happens to those spectators if they're used to enjoying this kind of scene? What happens to the military if they realize that they might end up a, a gladiator and being forced to do this? What happens to a society that enjoys this and starts finding children, for example, practicing being gladiators, enjoying being cruel to others? So the consequentialists may say, look, I, I, I object to this too, I agree with you. And I also agree that it doesn't matter how many people are in the stands or watching on TV. But I want to say, as soon as you take into account the long-term effects and the effects on people's characters, you should come to the opposite conclusion and say, no, 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 this is a terrible thing. So I'm not sure it really works as an objection to utilitarianism or consequentialism once we think about those subtler long-term effects. Here's one that might be a little trickier. The healthy patient. Someone goes into the hospital for routine tests. This person is an orphan, has no friends really, um, has come from another part of the world, uh, really doesn't know anyone, and checks in just because they think, well, I'm in a new country, I, I really ought to be examined. I mean, you know, I, I was not feeling so well in the boat ride over here. I want to make sure nothing really is wrong. So they go to the hospital. And at that point, they're checked over. <laughs> and Yes, the doctor confirms there's nothing wrong with this person. They're totally healthy. However, in this hospital, we have all sorts of sick people. We have some people who cannot see, but with an eye transplant could see. We've got people who are in desperate need of lung transplants, heart transplants, liver transplants, kidney transplants. We could save a number of lives, let's say five lives, and maybe restore sight and improve the lives of some others if we simply carved up this healthy patient and used his organs to help the others. Now, you might say, I, well, wait, what about his loved ones? And what about his friends and family? They're going to be horrified. This does terrible damage to people other than this guy. Well, it turns out we've investigated. He has no friends. He has no family. Uh, no one will know. He's just come to this country. He doesn't even have a place to live. Nobody's going to miss him. Is it acceptable? Well, the consequentialist might say, um, five lives saved, some others improved, one life gone. Uh, that looks like a pretty good consequence. I'm worried about all these long-term consequences, but wait a minute, we built it so that nobody will ever know. Nobody will ever know. And so there are no secondary effects to worry about. So shouldn't the consequentialist say, yeah, carve him up? 
That's a very disturbing thought. And so we might think, look, um, yeah, doesn't the consequentialist have to say the doctor not only <laughs> may, but should carve up the healthy patient to save the others? That seems clearly the wrong answer. Well, can a consequentialist respond? The case has been built carefully as to make it the case that there are no, none of these other secondary effects. But you might say, well, wait, I, I'm not so sure about that. After all, some people are going to know. Maybe the people who receive the organs have no idea where they've come from, and so they won't know. But the doctors and nurses, they're going to know what happened. Somebody is going to have to carve this guy up who's perfectly healthy. Somebody is going to have to be in a position of lying, committing this sort of fraud, filling out fraudulent paperwork, doing a variety of things. They're going to know. And so what happens if that gets out? Now, you might say, well, that won't get out. Nobody tells. They all keep the secret. But look, as we're about to make the decision, do we know that nobody will tell that this will be a one-off type of thing? And in fact, if it works, aren't these very people at the hospital going to say, well, hey, let's do that again. That worked out really well. So all of a sudden, are you confident that now hospitals are going to retain their reputation as places where you go to be healed instead of places where you're really risking your life if you're healthy? You already might feel that way about hospitals. I know my grandfather did. He said, yeah, don't go to a hospital. People get sick and die in there. And that sounds like something of a joke, but actually it is serious. There are a lot of diseases that people catch in hospitals. My own mother died of an infection she caught in the hospital when she was being treated for something else. And so this is something that happens all the time. Well, what if it happened even more routinely and not accidentally, not despite everybody's best efforts at sanitation, but instead you knew that doctors and nurses might do this. Something like this can happen in veterinary care where we allow euthanasia, which we don't allow in hospitals for human beings, at least in the United States. You might be reluctant to take your cat or dog to the vet because you might think, I think they're going to say it's time to put him down. And I don't think it is. I don't want to do that. And so you might worry about that. Presumably the cat or the dog is not completely healthy in this case, but still you might think is not terminal. And something like that has happened in the Netherlands, which did legalize euthanasia for human beings. Um, all sorts of people, it began to be reported, were being euthanized that did not meet the legal criteria, that did not give consent, that were not terminally ill, and so forth. And all of a sudden you might think, I'm afraid to go to the hospital. I don't know what they're going to do to me. And that is going to have devastating effects on the healthcare system. So it's not obvious at all that the consequentialist has to say, look, taking into account the long-term effects and all of that, yeah, I, I still approve of this. There are lots of consequentialist reasons why you might oppose it. That brings us to maybe the most famous issue that people have dealt with in thinking about consequentialism and other kinds of theories, namely the trolley problem. It can be used as an objection to consequentialism, but also as an objection to other theories, and even as something that suggests that really our own moral intuitions are either unstable, as some people think, or incoherent, as some others think, or at least are relying on factors that these other theories are not really capturing. I was once in a movie where I had the job of reflecting on a variety of moral problems. The movie was called The Problem of Evil, and one of those problems was the trolley problem. So let me show you a little clip of that movie where I talk about the trolley problem. Imagine that you're the driver of a runaway trolley car. You're going down a hill. The brakes don't work. The track forks into two. On the left side, there are five workmen who aren't aware of you and can't get out of the way. On the right track is one workman who, again, is unaware of your presence and has nowhere to go to get away. If you go to the left, five people are going to be killed. If you go to the right, one. What should you do? It's an easy problem. It's painful. It's horrible. But everyone agrees you should steer toward the one rather than the five. What about this case? You're on an overpass. You see the runaway trolley coming down the track, and you realize the only way to stop it and to save the five people is to push the fat man standing beside you off the overpass and in front of the oncoming train. It will kill him, but it will save the five. Should you do it? Here's another variation. Suppose you divert the trolley car 
onto the side track. There's no one standing on it, but there's an obstacle there. It will derail the train. The train will fly off the tracks and hit someone who's simply sitting in his backyard sipping lemonade. Should you do it? Most people say no. When we think about all of these variations, we realize several things. One is that we change our minds depending on small things, whether the person is the driver or just a bystander, whether the person is on the track already or would have to be pushed onto it, whether the person is a workman or simply someone sitting in his backyard. All of those things seem to make a difference, but it's hard to explain why they make any difference. In every situation, it feels as if it's a simple choice. Kill one in order to save five. Sometimes we think that's acceptable. Sometimes we don't. It's hard to understand the difference. Here's the overall point. We have two systems for thinking about moral questions. One of them is an intuitive, emotionally laden system. It's largely unconscious, and yet it gives us strong responses about what we ought to do and what we shouldn't do. There's another system of conscious reflection, of morality, of rules. One problem is that these two systems don't seem to match up very well. We come up with judgments on the basis of our unconscious intuitive reactions that we can't explain from a rational moral point of view. In a famous paper on the trolley problem, the author writes, my personal feeling is, personal feeling, Maybe in the end, that's all we have. But of course, what if your personal feeling is different from mine? Is there anything left to say? Maybe not, but we go on talking anyway. Why? We're afraid of what would happen if we didn't. So here's the simple case of the trolley problem. I simplified a little bit for dramatic purposes in that film, but the idea is accurately portrayed. You're a bystander. You see this switch. There's a runaway trolley headed down the track. And if there were five people on each side, well, of course you wouldn't flip it, right? You'd save no lives by flipping it. You'd just kill a different set of people. If there were five people on one side and nobody on the other side and no other problems, you'd of course divert it. So there are some easy sorts of cases here. You wouldn't mess with, you wouldn't kill in the case where there was no particular advantage, and you would save a life if you had a chance and there were no cost. But now the hard case is this. Five people are on the track the train is headed toward. One is on the other track. You could divert it, saving the five, but you would kill the one. In the film, I said, everybody thinks you should do it. Actually, that's not true, but the vast majority do. 70 to 80% think you should flip the switch. And so, in thinking that way, their thinking is consequentialist. They're saying, I know you kill one, but, but you do save five. It looks like, in a, on balance, four lives are saved. It looks like there are good consequences to doing this. And notice, in this case, we don't have to worry a lot about long-term effects. It's not as if people often find themselves in this kind of situation, uh, and you know, you're thinking, well, gosh, this is going to set a bad example. I mean, it looks as if this is pretty much a one-off case where the long-term effects uh, seem minimal. So most people agree, yes, flip the switch. However, <laughs> yeah, that's a, a sort of silly one. There's uh, the cat flipping a coin about whether or not to do it. But here's the fat man case. Now, instead of doing this, you have to push someone into the way of the trolley in order to save the five. At this point, it reverses. The vast majority say, I wouldn't do it. Why? In this case, you actually have to contact the person. The person isn't already in the on the track. The person isn't already in trouble, isn't in any danger. And so all of those things make it a difference, presumably. Now, I think there's something else making a difference here. You can stipulate the case so that this guy is going to stop the train, but how would you really know that? In practice, you'd have to be guessing about that. So it seems to me there's another variable that makes people less willing to make the sacrifice of the one for the sake of the five. Then there are other kinds of issues that arise when we start thinking about these things, like who is down there? For example, this situation. Ever heard of the trolley problem? 
No, what is it? A trolley is barreling toward five helpless people in the tracks. You can pull a lever to direct it onto another track, but can I reach the lever without getting up? Wait, I'm not… In this scenario, how busy am I? <laughs> I? I guess I forgot who I was talking to. For a dollar, I'll promise to pull the lever if one of the five people is you. And all of the, I mean, it's a, that's a joke. But there is a sense in which if you could pause, right? You could hit pause in the scenario and say, well, hold on a second. I, there's a lot more I'd like to know here. Like, um, who are these people? How did they get on the track? Um, and lots of things might be relevant. The five people tied up here are all terminally ill patients. They're all very, very elderly. It's one small child who's perfectly healthy tied up on the track on the other side. Now what do you do? Um, and we can complicate the case in all sorts of ways like that. Um, that one person happens to be your mother or your brother or your sister. Um, so we can do a lot to make our intuitions change about this case. Now sometimes we can say, well, I can explain why. Other times we might be scratching our heads saying, I don't know why it should make a difference. It seems to make a big difference, for example, whether you can pull a switch or whether you actually have to physically contact someone. That kind of immediacy, that kind of proximity makes a moral difference to people. But I'm not aware of any ethical theory that really explains why that's true. Something similar goes on with respect to thinking about the issue of whether the person is a workman on the track, whether your job is to flip the switch or whether you're just a bystander. That seems to make a moral difference. A lot more people are willing to flip the switch if they have that as their job than if they're just a bystander who happens by. They're, there's a temptation then to say, I don't want to get involved. Whereas if it's your job, you're already involved. Similarly with the workman. It's also, it might be, look, you're on the track because that's your job to be on the track. That's different from someone innocently being on the track and so forth. So all of those things seem to make a difference to us. But it is hard to explain why they make a difference. There are other kinds of cases we can introduce to make us worry about whether consequentialism is giving the right answer. What if I can produce better results in a particular case by using someone as a mere means, by deceiving them, by coercing them, by exploiting them, torturing them, killing them? Well, that's a bit like our Fort Sensible case where you can allow someone innocent to die, but in this case, you may do other things. You may be tricking someone, coercing them, forcing them into something. You might be exploiting them. You might be torturing them to find out where the bomb is located. I used to be a great fan of a TV show called 24 in which Jack Bauer would do all sorts of things to try to save Los Angeles, including breaking people's fingers to torture them to make them to reveal the location of the bomb and so on. And you might think the consequentialist says all that's justified. Some people are going to say it's never justified. Others will say, well, um, I don't know, maybe <laughs> I need to know a lot more about the case. And those are kinds of situations that are going to divide moral theories and that deserve uh, you know, very careful consideration. There's something similar when we think about the theory of Confucius or the theory of Aristotle versus a consequentialist theory. What if I can produce better results in a particular case by ac acting contrary to virtue, doing something that a virtuous person would not do, really getting my hands dirty? Wartime is a case where people often think I'm put in positions like this. I have to do things that I really would not otherwise do, that I don't think a virtuous person would do. I may end up coming back from the war thinking I did a lot of things I'm not proud of. I, I, I don't want people to know about the things I did. I stand by them. I did them. I think they were the right thing to do. I think I had to do them because of the consequences of not doing them. But I think it was a pretty horrible thing for a human being to do, and I don't like the person I became in that setting. So those kinds of tensions are really possible. In fact, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote about this after World War II, talking about the problem of dirty hands, meaning exactly that. What if in order to obtain consequences that are really not only better but really vitally important to many, many people, you have to do things that are very far from virtuous. We can be put in situations like that. All of these are cases that I think are, well, things you could take as arguments against consequentialism, but they could also be used as arguments in favor of consequentialism or as things that point in another direction entirely, saying consequentialists have identified a really important dimension of moral reasoning. Is it the only dimension of moral reasoning? 
Maybe, but maybe it's not. Maybe there are some other dimensions that people like Aristotle, Immanuel Kant, and a variety of other people have identified, or some of which may be part of our intuitive conception of morality, but nobody has identified. And it's a question of how we balance those against each other. These cases make us force, well, force us to think hard about those balancing questions. And it's not obvious at all that we really have any clear explanation of how we ought to do it.